Well, I want to welcome you once again to the Nichols household. My name's Eric. I'm blessed to be uh, the lead pastor for Connection Church. We're going to get started in the Word, and today we're going to continue this message series entitled Overcomer. I've entitled this message, Choose Your Weapon. Choose Your Weapon. Now that phrase, when you stop and think about it, I think for me it brings the, the visual or it brings the image of some of the movies I might have seen when two people are coming into a duel and whoever is overseeing the duel will pull out this plethora of weapons and they'll say, choose your weapon. And each one of those people, they'll pick one that will make sense to them. Like it's one that they've probably practiced or they feel comfortable with and they choose that weapon. And so what I want us to do is I want us to look at some of our weapons that we have for spiritual warfare, and I want us to choose the right weapon. Uh, we have a tendency to choose the wrong weapons, right? And so we looked at James chapter 4, verse 1 through 8 last week, and it poses that question, what causes fights and quarrels among you? And what we saw in that passage is that oftentimes we choose the wrong enemy. Um, it's not... Uh, it's not against flesh and blood, and we'll get to that verse here in a second. Well, it's not against flesh and blood that we're fighting against. There's a spiritual battle going on. And so we oftentimes will choose the wrong enemy, and then we'll grab a hold of the wrong weapon. We'll use our words, or we'll use our attitudes, we'll use our talents, instead of using the proper weapon, because ultimately we're using the wrong strategy. So I would like for us to really focus in on what the right weapons could possibly be. And today, I, I'm telling you, I am super so stoked to share with you the weapon that we're going to talk about. Um, uh, in this whole context of wrong enemy, wrong weapon, wrong strategy, there's another, another verse that reiterates this. It's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. It says, our battle's not against flesh and blood. We're not fighting against other human beings, but there's uh, these rulers, these authorities, uh, the powers and, of the dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenlies. There's this heavenly uh, battle that is going on. And so we have to, as, as people who are believers, have to have that uh, spiritual mindset just as much as the physical mindset. And we have to remember that all the battles that we're fighting, they're not necessarily a physical battle. So we want to choose the right weapon. Well, what we learned last week, in order for us to, to lean into that and to come into the right context, it requires submission. Uh, we read this verse, James chapter 4, verse 7. It says, submit yourselves to God, uh, therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. We have to submit to God and to his big mission. That's what he calls for us to do is to submit to his big mission. Uh, I was talking with some of the elders this week and some of the men during men's group and pastor, or pastor, sorry, pastor Mike, we'll call him pastor Mike, uh, elder, one of our elders, Mike Yates, uh, he mentioned something that I had not seen before and I thought this was really cool. But last week I talked about how our mission, mission is under the big mission, therefore it requires submission. But what he said is, in order for us to even be on mission, um, in order for us to have admission, it requires submission. And then what happens is we join in on commission. I thought that was pretty cool. I, I think it's pretty awesome. In order for, because scripture tells us, in order for us to even enter the kingdom of heaven, to see the kingdom of heaven, we have to humble ourselves, submit to humble ourselves like a child. And when we do that, now we're on a co-mission with Christ. Uh, I think that's a pretty powerful thought. Now, as we're thinking about being on that mission, we have to realize that there are some weapons that we're going to want to utilize. See, I want to say this right. I think it's so in this transition, as I transition to this weapon, I want to say this right. I want us to understand that as we submit to God, the reason we do that is because He's worthy. We do that because He is deserving of our worship. And what I realized this week is that worship is actually can be utilized as a weapon. I didn't know that. I didn't think of it. Now, I, I kind of knew that, but I didn't know it to the extent that I know now. So what I want to do is I want to prove to you that worship is something that can actually be weaponized. But first, let's look at what does worship mean. 
worship, if we were to break this down, uh, you break down the English language. Let's go back real quick to the, the word worship real quick. If you look at this worship, uh, this word worship, what you see is uh, that prefix talks about worth. And so what I, what I see in this is this ship is a, vessel, is a vessel that takes something to God. So worship is our way of sending to God how much we praise Him, how much we adore Him, how worthy He is of that praise. And it literally is like a vessel that sends. So I call this the worth ship. But what I've come to realize is that it can also be a war ship. It doesn't just have to be a vessel that brings this worth to him, this value to him. But in addition to that, it can also be one that can be utilized for spiritual warfare. Uh, here's the phrase that I like to use. It's a vessel of, of service to the king. That's what this ship is. It's a vessel of service to the king that has his name inscribed on the bow. By the way, the word bow is also the word that we use that's tied to humility and submission. And it says, and if uh, the enemy gets in the way, it's all cannons blazing. So what we're saying is this vessel is not just a vessel uh, that takes this worth to God, but it's also one that can be turned on the enemy to take down the enemy. And I can prove that. I can totally prove that. So let's look at some passages of Scripture together. Let's go to Judges chapter 7. And let's look at how Gideon uses worship. He, he takes worship and he weaponizes it for the sake of winning a spiritual battle as well as a physical battle. Now here's what's happening in Judges chapter 7. The Israelites had been oppressed by the Midianites. God comes to Gideon in a, in a time when he's actually hiding out and he says, I want you to lead my people into battle. Now that's a whole different story. I can't get into all of it, but we get to the point where he goes, okay, I accept that role. And then God has him bring the men of Israel and prepare them for battle. He starts with 32,000 men. God says, you have too many. See, I'm going to win this battle. You're not. He says, you have too many. So he whittles it down to 10,000. Now there's 10,000 remaining. And he says, you still have too many. He goes, okay. So he whittles it down to 300. We're talking about 300 men that are fighting against hundreds of thousands of people. We're, we're coming against a major army. And we're coming against that army with 300 men. Because this was God's, uh, this was God's victory. It wasn't Gideon's victory. Which brings us... Um, to uh, this, I think, real intriguing moment where Gideon is told by the Lord that he could go down into the enemy's camp and listen to what the enemy is saying. So he goes down in, in the night. It's darker. He goes down and he hides and uh, he kind of mingles among them and he listens to some of the enemy talking. And the enemy talks about what these two guys are talking. And one says to the other one, I had a dream. And the dream was this barley loaf came flying down through camp and just wiped the place out. And he says, what do you think the dream meant? So here's uh, Judges chapter 7, verse 14. It says, and his comrade answered, this is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. So the Lord has spoken, not just to Gideon, because now he's spoken to Gideon through the interpretation of the dream, which, by the way, if you want to look at Scripture, Daniel said interpretations of dreams come from the Lord. So what we know is this interpretation was a word from God. This interpretation was one that would have been spoken. Only God can give that interpretation. Um, so you're looking at it, and, and he hears this translation, and this is what's so cool. He says, as soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, what did he do? He worshiped immediately. I mean, he leaned right into worship. You realize that this is the beginning. The battle's already occurring. The warfare is already going on. It says, and he returned to the camp of Israel and he said, arise for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And he divided the 300 men into three companies 
He put trumpets into the hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. So watch what I do. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, uh, then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and shout. It says, shout for the Lord and for Gideon. It goes on to say, so Gideon and the hundred men uh, who were with him, so they were broken into three groups of a hundred, with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch when they had just set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hand the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. Now, this is really good, so I hope that, that y'all grab a hold of this. It says, And they cried out, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. A sword for the Lord. Now that word Lord right there in my Bible is all caps, meaning it's the Yahweh statement. It's the I am statement. A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp. Now watch what happens. And all the army ran. They cried out and they fled. The enemy's fleeing. It says, and when they blew the three hundred or the yeah the three hundred trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. And the army fled. And literally, they began to attack each other. And here's what I want you to see: in this passage, we see that Gideon uh, he worshipped before any physical uh, physical attack ever occurred. There was a spiritual battle that occurred before there was ever a physical battle. And I, I asked myself, I was kind of confused, why would you throw Gideon's name in the shout? I thought, man, was Gideon just being arrogant? Was Gideon just being... And, and then it, it hit me that that was a word from the Lord. That was a word from the Lord. Yeah, Daniel said that interpretations from dreams, he, he said, Joseph said that. Joseph said to Pharaoh, he said, this dream that, it, that I'm about to interpret, I'm not giving you the interpretation the Lord is. So it's the, the word of the Lord. And so when he said, say this, say um, the, for the Lord and for Gideon, he said, say what the Lord has already said. Why is that important? Because the enemy's camp had been talking about this Gideon guy had been talking about uh, the dream, more than likely, that this guy had. And he had already, God had already struck fear in their hearts. And when he spit that out, do you realize he combined worship, because he said for the Lord, he combined worship with the word of the Lord, and it was like a bomb went off. It, it was like a spiritual explosion occurred. Why is that important? Because you weaponize worship when you combine it with the Word. Mm, that's good. I wish I, I had somebody in the crowd who could say amen, but it's not even possible right now. Maybe you could say it there, but I want you to understand this. When you take worship and you apply the Word to it, you have created a, an incredible weapon. It is a warship. And I mean, that's a powerful thought. Why is that important? Because we can apply that to our lives. This is a simple and practical thing that we can do in our lives. And we can just begin to sing. And when we sing worship, and worship, listen, worship isn't just song. It's also uh, saying the names of God. and saying, there's, there's a number of ways to worship. The, the scripture actually says that when we serve God, we're worshiping him. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says that, that we are to lay ourselves on the altar. This is our spiritual act of service, our spiritual act of worship. So when we serve the Lord and we do that and we combine that with the Word, it weaponizes that worship. I mean, wouldn't that change uh, the way that you encounter things in your workplace, wouldn't that change the way you encounter the confrontations with family members? Wouldn't that change the way that you... Uh, I, I, all right, so all encounters and confrontations, wouldn't it change the way that you do that? I think so. so. We just take 
and we apply worship to those moments and watch what God can do. You're like, well, that was just one case. You can't prove it any more than that. Pfft, come on. Seriously, you know me better than that. By the way, I found this intriguing, that the sword for the Lord and for Gideon, that the word, in the English language, if you take the S off, you have this root word of word. Uh, the reason that I think I love play on words, so it's just one of those things I love. But what we find is the number one weapon of our warfare in Ephesians chapter 6 is the word of the Lord, which is the sword of the Lord. Come on, y'all. I mean, seriously, come on. Go to Ephesians chapter 6, read the, uh, the armor, and you see that the weapon that he gave us is his word. It's uh, sharp as a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of our life. And when we apply the word to worship, it cuts and it has life. It's living and it's active. I mean, how powerful is that thought? And this is what hit me. If you read the story of David and Goliath, I didn't even realize this until I got into this study this week. If you read the story of David and Goliath, what you realize is David attacked Goliath with worship before he ever threw a stone. I'm, I want to have a shout fit. I mean, I'm just kind of having my own little party up in here, but uh, I hope that you're grabbing this. You say, well, prove that to me. He said to Goliath before he ever threw a stone, he said, you come against me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Woo! Get back to that whole message we did a couple of weeks ago. Who is this King of glory? He is the Lord of hosts. I come against you with a, in the name of the Lord of hosts. Who, this is the Lord, the God of the army of Israel. Prepare to die. He said, you're about to lose this battle. Before he ever threw a stone, he came with worship. That's pretty exciting stuff to me. And then I think about Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas are hanging out in jail, right? And what do they do? Y'all know the story. They're hanging out in jail and worship occurs. In the middle of the night, they're imprisoned. And they begin to worship. And it, it kind of blew my mind as to what happened with this worship. All right. Worship in and of itself is there's this spiritual battle that occurs, but at the same time, uh, it begins to manifest itself in the physical. And the jailers listening to the worship the other prisoners are listening to the worship. And because Paul and Silas chose not to complain and whine and feel sorry for themselves as they were sitting in that jail cell, instead they chose to turn their eyes towards the one that mattered, uh, to fix their eyes, to take the worthiness of God and put it on that ship and send it off to him, that vessel, to send it off to him. Because they chose to do that, warfare occurred. And this earthquake occurs, and here's, uh, I, I love this statement. Uh, for Paul and Silas, worship blew the prison doors off the hinges. Literally blew the, the, the prison doors off the hinges. Set other captives free, not just them, but set other captives free. The jailer said, what must I do to be saved? It wasn't just a physical freedom that they found. They found a spiritual freedom. Freedom. They found freedom for their soul, and it began with worship and reduced the entire jailhouse to rubble. I mean, how powerful is that thought? I, I want us to lean into um, who we are in Christ. And, and in order for us to do that, I'm going to wrap it up in Romans chapter 8, starting with verse 31. So if you would just go ahead and, and turn there. I'm hoping, like everything else, that this is as exciting for you as it was for me. What I've come to realize is it doesn't always happen that way, but I truly believe that the Spirit's trying to teach us something in this season. Uh, we're fighting our battles oftentimes. Uh, we're focused on the wrong enemy. We're choosing the wrong weapons, which is the wrong strategy. And He's literally giving us the proper strategy to be overcomers. 
The Bible tells us that we're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And I'm going to show that to you here in a second. And what I want you to understand is the God that we serve is worthy of our worship. So we should, we should worship just for that. that I mean, that's, that's enough reason and enough cause for us to worship him because we should be sending that vessel uh, that says he's worthy to him all the time. It, literally, we should be sending that his way. But then when you realize that it actually can be used as a strategy for spiritual warfare, that should make you lean in even more. Are you saying that enemies can can come down, that strongholds can come down? Absolutely. When we begin to worship, and then when you take worship and you mix it with the Word, it's like a nuclear bomb. I mean, I don't know any other way to put it. It becomes a weapon of mass destruction in spiritual sense, in a good sense, for the sake of victory. Don't you want these kinds of weapons for your family? Don't you want these for your own sake? Don't you want these for the kingdom to advance? Absolutely. So let's lean in and go, okay, God is worthy of worship. That's enough reason for us to worship him. But then let's go, all right, we can actually win some battles by worshiping. That would make us want to worship even more. So I want us to see that what God says about us as victors, as overcomers. Romans chapter 8, starting with verse 31, says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? Is that worthy of worship? I I can't hear you. Yeah. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. He's interceding for you and for me. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, we're going, we're going to start talking about the season that we're in. We're going to get personal, okay? Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? That's a question. Can any of these things separate us? As it is written, for your sake, we are all being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. Uh, He's answering the questions, by the way. He's answering the questions that he just asked. Shall tribulation, distress, any of these things separate us? He says, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are victorious through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor COVID-19, nor canceled schools, nor canceled sporting events, nor, oh, I'm talking to you now, Um, none of these things, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from Him. And because of that, He is worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our worship. But we also need to come from the mindset that we are already victorious in Him. And don't you think that will affect your worship? Don't you think that will affect your worship? And then, don't you think that will affect the outcome of the battles that you've been fighting. If you will, instead of fighting against flesh and blood, if you'll just turn in and worship God and say, God, I know you're working in this moment. Give me wisdom. Help me know how to interact with these people or whatever it is. Help me to deal with this circumstance, this situation of my life, this financial issue, uh, what's going on with my home, what's going on with my work, what's going on with my school. Help me handle that. But right now, I'm just going to worship you in all of this. I'm going to continue to lean into you in all of this because you're worthy of worship. You've got this. And can I tell you, the enemy hates that. He hates that. 
He wants you to turn on your brothers. He wants you to turn on your sisters. He wants you to turn on, on people instead of turning on him. But when we fix our eyes on Jesus, who's the author and perfecter of our faith, then we run this race properly and we win these battles properly. There's a song that we've been singing over the last month or two called The Blessing. Um, it comes from Deuteronomy. It actually comes from a blessing that Aaron was given as the high priest over Israel. Now, he was given this to speak it over God's people. Uh, I didn't realize until this week, this, the, the, the things that, that I'm just oblivious to, and then all of a sudden God goes, hey, hello, it's been there all along. I don't know, maybe I'm the only person that has that. But I didn't realize until this week some of the things that have been going on around us. This plaque behind me, it's that verse. It's, and I said Deuteronomy, it's actually Numbers, I apologize. Numbers chapter 6. I gave you the wrong uh, address earlier. But it's in Numbers chapter 6. It's right behind me. I didn't even, listen, we've had that plaque for a long time, and it didn't hit me that that's the song that we've been singing. This was the crazy thing. I was watching, I was looking on social media on Facebook, and April Willett posted a picture of her husband, who's our worship pastor, Wes Willett. Don't you love Wes Willett? Um, and right behind him, in his house, on the wall, guess what scripture was there? That one. And it just hit me that in this season, God is giving us a song, an avenue of worship that actually is a weapon. It's weaponized. You're taking this worship and you're applying a sharp edge to it. Now, I want you to think about that scripture. It says the word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. Um, it actually breaks down even more so, and it can be seen as a scalpel. What, what does that mean? Well, Worship can be used as surgery to cut the things out of us. that don't. The word, I'm sorry, the word can be used. But when we apply worship to that, it's doing the same thing can cut things out that are sickness in our life that we don't need. It can be used as a knife. It can be used as an edge that cuts and preps food so that we have nutrition, or it can be used as a weapon to fight the enemy. That's how the Word works. And then when you apply that to worship, it becomes so powerful.